thank you very much. So I would like to thank the organizers to, for letting me uh, present this, uh, this work. And I'm very sorry I cannot be in person uh, in Cambridge. So indeed, I will be speaking about certain relation between the physics of four-dimensional supersymmetric n equal one super, uh, uh, supersymmetric quantum field theories and integrable models, and more particularly eigenfunctions of these integrable models. So in this, there are many topics defining this workshop. So maybe the closest topics listed here is number theory, since I will be counting uh, certain things in this supersymmetric quantum field theories. This work is mainly based on uh, a, a recent paper together with my student Bilal Nazal and uh, Anthony Dellin, who is a postdoc and is moving to uh, to London, to King's College uh, this year. And uh, if you have any questions at any point of this talk, please uh, stop me uh, if it's possible and, uh, and ask them. So the basic theme of this talk is uh, this uh, old ob observation that uh, all happy families uh, are alike in certain sense. And the happy families that we will discuss uh, today are elliptic integrable models. These are some quantum mechanical systems, uh, which in principle are uh, exactly solvable. And physics of uh, six dimensional 1,0 SCFTs. So these uh, SCFTs will not appear in this talk directly, but rather indirectly. And the happy part of this family of, uh, of physical systems is that there is a claim that these systems are classified in certain sense. They are, they, are, they are much simpler than the CFTs, the CFTs in six dimensions in some sense, although we don't have an explicit Lagrangian construction for them. In certain senses, they are simpler than their lower dimensional counterparts. And the interplay between these two uh, physical uh, setups will be the main theme of this talk. Okay, so the outline of this talk is as follows. It will consist of three parts. So the first lengthy part will be a review of a rather old results about relation between the six DSCFTs and integrable models. And an important uh, notion that will appear there is of uh, what I like to call across dimensions uh, IR dualities. And I will uh, uh, discuss this in, in detail in, in, in a little bit. In uh, part two, we will uh, use the uh, uh, understanding, this old understanding about the relation between 6D CFTs and integrable models uh, to take a limit of uh, a certain limit of uh, four dimensional QFTs, which we'll call a limit of large compactification. This is, in some sense, to be contrasted, I guess, to the other main theme of this workshop of, say, large N limits of various uh, constructions. Uh, where you uh, study physics of uh, black holes and get into gravity. Here we will discuss limits of four-dimensional theories, which in some sense will take us into six-dimensional physics, as we will discuss. And finally, I will use all of these understandings to present some um, explicit results on computing uh, ground state eigenfunctions of certain integrable models in a rather general way. Okay, based on physical conjectures that we will discuss here, we will uh, have a very concrete mathematical prediction about uh, certain eigenfunctions of integrable models. So this is, uh, this is my outline. So let me start with part one, which is uh, a derivation of integrable models from six DSCFTs. And another name for this integrable model is, is a collection of what is called in mathematical literature analytical difference operators. Okay, so some collection of commuting analytical difference operators, joint eigenfunctions of which are of certain interest in various fields in uh, mathematical physics. So the starting point uh, of this discussion is a relation between six-dimensional physics and the four-dimensional physics. Okay? So we start in six dimensions with some 6D SCFT, and there, is, there are claims in the literature that these 6D SCFTs are uh, classified. We know what these uh, SCFTs can be. And uh, what we do to these SCFTs, we deform them with certain relevant deformation, which is geometric. We place these SCFTs on a compact space, which uh, will be two-dimensional in this talk, so on some Riemann uh, surface. And uh, this Riemann surface can have uh, some genus, it can have certain uh, holes in it, certain punctures, and we can turn on background gauge fields for various symmetries in six dimensions, which we'll call fluxes. 
And then in low energy, in, in, in the limit of low energy, in the infrared, we will effectively obtain a four-dimensional physics. We will obtain a four-dimensional theory. So there will be some effective uh, four-dimensional uh, setup in the end of the day. So there is a, a renormalization group flow across dimensions, starting from six dimensions and ending in four dimensions. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, that one can ask about these uh, constructions, and starting with the seminal work of Gayoto already many years ago, a lot of these questions will be asked. One particular, uh, a lot of questions were asked. One particular question is whether uh, there is another construction of the same fixed point in the infrared in four dimension, starting directly in four dimensions. For example, uh, there can be a Lagrangian theory, a theory defined uh, using a vanilla Lagrangian, which follows to the same um, uh, infrared, uh, um, uh, infrared theory. If such a situation exists, if there is a construction starting from six dimension and a situation and, and the construction starting from uh, four dimension leading to, a same, uh, to the same quantum field theory in four dimensions, we will say that we have an across dimensions, uh, an IR duality across dimension. Okay? So there is, uh, we construct a field theory which has some geometric origin in terms of 6D data and some Riemann surface and uh, background gauge fields and so on. And there is a, an independent Lagrangian description. Okay, so these are the quantum field theories, the n equal one four dimensional quantum field theories that we will discuss. When we construct these theories, we will always preserve n equal one as supersymmetry. So we'll, we will always get four dimensional n equal one as QFTs in the end of the day. Now we will want to, to compute something about this quantum field theory. A very interesting uh, set of quantities that one can compute about four-dimensional quantum field theories are certain uh, types of um, uh, partition functions. Okay, and the partition functions uh, function that will be of a particular interest uh, for us is what is called the supersymmetric index in four dimension. There are numerous nice properties uh, that these uh, quantities have one of these uh, one of these properties is that this uh, this partition function don't depend on uh, various continuous parameters of the theory such as couplings or even on a uh, renormalization group flow for example if uh, these quantities are something that is something that we can compute uh, in, in using the lagrangian in the uv and take the deformation in certain very, very uh, simple account. And then uh, the, the partition function that we'll compute in the UV will tell us something about the physics in the infrared. The definition, the details of the definition of this uh, partition function of the supersymmetric index are not extremely important, but what is important that it is a very well-defined function that we can associate to any theory, which depends on a variety of parameters. So the index is just a trace over uh, the, the, the Hilbert space of the theory quantized on S3 or in radial quantization, where we turn on various parameters, very, various fugacities. So we count states or equivalently count operators with, with various weights, for example, with minus one to the F, with two uh, parameters that we will denote by Q and P, which couple to certain combination of uh, quantum numbers related to the superconformal group. So J1 and J2 are the Cartan generators of the SO4 isometry of the sphere, and R is the R symmetry. So these are uh, very sp uh, two special parameters. These uh, combinations of charges commute with a certain choice of supercharge. So the supersymmetric index is uh, a certain type of uh, Witten index. In addition to these two parameters, Q and P, we can also turn on a variety of other parameters, which I will collectively denote by U, which couple to the uh, Cartan generators of the global symmetry of a theory at hand. So for any theory in four dimensions, for any n equal one theory, we can compute an index, which is function of parameters Q and P. And uh, in addition, we can turn on these parameters U, the number of which and properties of which depend on a particular theory at hand, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the symmetry that the theory has. So again, given a theory T, which is in our setup is defined by 6D CFT and the compactification surface and various additional data, we can compute a function, the supersymmetric index, which is a function of, uh, uh, of many parameters. Okay. So uh, let me stress again the nature 
of various parameters. And as I already stressed, there are two parameters which are special. These are these parameters Q and P, which we'll call the superconformal fugacities because they couple to charges in the superconformal uh, group. And uh, there are these parameters which couple to the global symmetry, which I denoted by U. And actually, there are two types of uh, global symmetries that we can have in this set. So first type of parameters uh, uh, have uh, their origin in six dimensions. So the four dimensional theories we obtain uh, 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 begin their life in six dimensions. And the six dimensional theory can have some symmetries G6D. This G6D can be broken by some details of the compactification. For example, the flux that we uh, put on the Riemann surface uh, and so on. But in general, we expect at least a subgroup of G6D, G6D to be a symmetry group of uh, the four dimensional theory. So some of these parameters U uh, are related to the six dimensional symmetry. Another set of uh, symmetries are uh, related to the punctures that we can uh, put on the Riemann surface. So we are compactifying the 6D theory on a punctured Riemann surface. I will not get into details because this will not be very important of how exactly punctures give rise to symmetries, but the intuition to have is that when you have a puncture on the Riemann surface, you need to define somehow the boundary conditions at the puncture. And the way to do that is to first compactify the six-dimensional theory to five dimensions on a circle. Then often this five-dimensional theory effect, uh, can be described effectively as a five-d gauge theory. And then uh, putting boundary or specifying boundary conditions at the puncture, is equivalent to analyzing uh, boundary conditions uh, in five dimensions. Like you cut uh, space along, uh, uh, like you you place a boundary in five dimensions, a four-dimensional boundary. You need to specify certain boundary conditions for the gauge fields, and say if you freeze the gauge fields at the boundary, then the five-dimensional gauge group becomes a flavor symmetry associated to the punch. Okay, so there are these. Uh, two uh, different types of symmetries, both of them uh, will be important for us. And depending on what type of boundary conditions you choose at the puncture, there is a variety of global symmetries you can have which are associated to the punctures. There is a kind of a maximal choice where the symmetry associated to the puncture is the 5D gauge group, and we will call such punctures maximal punctures. And then you can have punctures with smaller amount of symmetry and the smallest amount of symmetry, which will be rank 1, either U1 or SU2, uh, the, the corresponding punctures will be called uh, minimal uh, punctures. And here are some examples. So, for example, if you take a 2,0, A1 type, a 2,0 theory and compactify it on a certain type of three punctures here, then uh, as uh, David de Gaiotto told us a long time ago, the theory you obtain uh, in four dimensions is just some collection of free fields. And the, uh, the explicit computation of the index of these uh, free fields, of this uh, so-called tri-fundamental chiral superfield, is given in terms of this elliptic gamma function, where elliptic gamma function is a certain type of a special function. So it's not uh, why you get an elliptic gamma function. I don't have a one-line um, deep explanation of, but it's just the result of a computation. You just compute this partition function, which is given uh, in this expression for free chiral fields, and uh, what you obtain is, uh, is expressions in terms of uh, this uh, elliptic uh, gamma function. Another example, if, if you take a rank one Easting theory, which is just another 6D SCFT, and again place it on a three punctured sphere with a certain val uh, value of flux, you obtain an SQ3 n equal one SQCD with an F equal six. And its index is given uh, by this expression, Again, it is given by various products of these elliptic gamma functions, uh, which are integrated uh, over with some contour integral. So the main point, again, the details are not very important, but what I want to stress is that there is a very explicit uh, expression for these functions, and they are rather non-trivial functions, the indices. Okay? So here I would say that this SU3 n equal 1 SQCD with an F equal 6 is uh, infrared across dimensions dual to this construction of e uh, rank one Easting theory compactified on a three puncture sphere. And here, A1 2,0 CFT compactified on a three puncture sphere is across dimensions dual to a certain collection of free uh, chiral superfluid. And again, I, please ask me questions at any point if you, if you have them. Okay. Are there any questions?
Okay. So let me continue. So next, I will discuss certain properties of uh, of these indices uh, that we obtain. So some of these properties are generic, and some of these properties uh, uh, are related to the fact that there is a geometry behind the theories that we have. So the next property I will discuss is related to, to geometry. So say I obtained an index of a theory corresponding to compactification on some Riemann surface with some genus, some types and numbers of punctures. And also uh, I have computed the index corresponding to another uh, to another compactification on another surface with another uh, types of punctures and another value of flux. So these are these two functions that I somehow computed. And now I want to compute the index corresponding to compactification on the combined surface. How do I combine the surface? I take two of the surfaces. I assume that uh, they, uh, each one of them has at least uh, one maximal puncture. And geometrically, what I do, I glue the surfaces along this uh, maximal puncture to com uh, obtain a bigger surface. And then I can ask what happens, what type of four-dimensional theory I get in this compactification. And more concretely, what is the index of that compactification? An important thing for us is that one can explicitly compute this index by just taking this, the indices of the, two, uh, of the two pieces building this surface and integrating them um, uh, together um, with some measure which is built from uh, uh, certain vector multiplets and maybe other chiral, chiral fields that I need to introduce when I'm, uh, uh, when I'm uh, kind of undoing this boundary condition that I discussed and, and gluing this, uh, these two surfaces, uh, these two, surf two surfaces together. Again, the details are not important. They, they, what is important for me, for you to understand, is that there is a very simple procedure to construct the indices of combined theories from the indices uh, of, the, um, of the pieces which build uh, the theory. And there are various um, choices in how to perform this gluing, so I'm not getting into those details. Um, so this, what exactly appears here can be a little bit uh, modified according to what you are doing, and this will give slightly different types of compactification. For example, it, it will depend, uh, it, it will uh, impact how exactly the fluxes associated uh, to the combined surface are computed and so on. So I'm hiding a lot of details here. So this is a property which is related to geometry, but we can also ask a much more general property, a general question. These indices are certain meromorphic functions of, you know, of a lot of parameters. So there are these parameters I denoted by U, parameters Q and T, and the indices in general have poles in those parameters. And we can ask what are what is the meaning of these poles, whether there is a physical meaning for the residue of different poles and for position of different poles. And the claim is very simple. Again, it's, some, it's an old result uh, appearing in this paper. The claim is like that. If we have a 4D theory with an operator which can uh, obtain a VEV, if we can turn on a, a VEV to a certain uh, operator, then the index will have uh, a pole corresponding to that operator. Okay, so if the weight of, the, uh, of, of that operator in the index is, say, U to the minus 1 times U star, where U is uh, fugacity for some U1 symmetry, and U star is the combination of fugacities for all the other symmetries, the index will have a pole when U approaches U star, when this um, uh, this combination is equal to 1. Basically, that means that we're setting the weight of the operator uh, in the index to be 1, which is the weight of the vacuum, so we turn on a vacuum expectation value. And then the claim is that the residue of the index when this happens is related to the index you will obtain in the infrared when you turn on this vacuum expectation value. Now, this vacuum expectation value that we turn on for operating this operator can be, uh, uh, or rather, this operator for which we turn on uh, the expectation value can have some space time indices or not have space time indices. It can be a scalar operator or not a scalar operator. And whether it is a scalar operator or not a scalar operator in the index depends whether uh, it, it, whether this combination of fugacities U star depends on uh, the combination of fugacities P over Q in some non-trivial non way or not. So the claim is, again, if this, uh, if this position of this pole doesn't depend on this, uh, on this, uh, com uh, on this combination of fugacities, we turn on a space-time constant path. And if it de depends, we turn on a combination which depends on space-time dependent path. 
And that means that the infra, in the infrared, we, uh, we break the four-dimensional Lorentz symmetry. And, this, and the performing the analysis of what actually we get in the infrared, one can arrive at the conclusion that one obtains a four-dimensional theory with a surface defect inserted at some certain point. And that surface defect breaks the Lorentz symmetry in, in the infrared. So this is, a, this is a, the point of this slide. So analytical properties of, the, of indices are related to what happens if we introduce certain types of certain surface defects into the uh, four-dimensional physics. Okay. Now we we can combine all of the uh, all, all of the pro different properties of the index that we have discussed uh, to play with the indices which come from six dimensions and to study their analytical properties. Okay. So here is uh, something that one can do. So say one uh, found uh, uh, an across dimensional duality or uh, one understood the index at least of a compactification of the three punctures here with two maximal punctures and one minimal puncture. Again, a minimal puncture is just, uh, it corresponds to a, a rank one a global symmetry. And one it constructs a, an index of a bigger theory by gluing to this three punctured sphere a generic Riemann surface uh, like this. And again, this uh, three puncture sphere can, might have some flux and uh, uh, the general theory might have uh, a bigger flux. We can uh, choose certain operators which can obtain a web uh, in this theory, which are charged under the symmetry, uh, under this U1 symmetry corresponding to this uh, minimal puncture. And the infrared, we since we turn on a, a, a vacuum expectation value for an operator which is charged under this uh, symmetry, we lose that symmetry. For certain types of these operators, there is a natural interpretation, a geometric interpretation, where the theory in the infrared is the same theory uh, we started with, okay, uh, or same geometry rather that we started with, but with a shifted value of flux. The shift depends on the on the flux of the three puncture spheres that we grew in, and also on the type of web that uh, of on the type of operator for which we give the web. So the shift the, that uh, that freedom is encoded in this shift a. Okay. Now in a nice situations we can find such a three puncture sphere and such a web so that this combination of fluxes a plus f prime is equal to zero. In particular, uh, uh, what what can happen is that if we uh, find such an operator uh, for which uh, A is such that A plus F prime is equal to zero, and this is a space, a time, uh, and we give us, uh, this operator is a scalar operator, so that we preserve a Lorentz symmetry in the infrared. If we turn on a web for such an operator, what will happen in the infrared will obtain uh, the same theory we started. So we start from a theory, we glue to it some stuff, then we deform uh, the combined theory by a web to some operator. And in the end of the day, we obtain the same theory as we started with, okay? However, if we turn on a, a vacuum expectation value to an operator, which satisfies this thing, but it is a space, it, the web is space-time dependent, a computation shows that what we will obtain is the index of the theory before we glued this stuff to it, but with a certain difference operator uh, which acts on it. And this difference operator depends on, uh, on what type of an operator we in, in the field theory we gave a web to. So one can classify these operators by the various types of uh, these difference operators which act on the index of the 4D theory by the various types of surface defects uh, that we can turn on. And if you wish, this is how surface defects are introduced into the index computation. So there is an index of a theory without a surface defect, and then there is an operator which acts on the index. It acts on, on, on certain fugacity in the index, on this fugacity Z, okay, the fugacity which sits in the same three punctured sphere. And we obtain an index of a theory with a surface operator. So this is the basic way how certain uh, difference operator, these analytical difference operators arise in index computation, okay? Now, this difference operator satisfy a lot of properties following from geometry. 
For example, the theories that we obtain in four dimensions, uh, uh, from starting from six dimensions, they, they depend on this uh, Riemann surface on which we place a six dimensional theory. But we can think about this six dimensional theory in different ways. Say we compactify on such a surface, and then we decouple from this surface a three punctured sphere, which has this maximal puncture and this minimal puncture. Then we perform our procedure and we get a, 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 this difference operator acting on this maximal puncture denoted here by Z. But alternatively, we can uh, move this minimal puncture on the surface to a different location and decouple a three punctured sphere, which has this maximal puncture and this minimal puncture. Again, re redo this computation and get a difference operator acting on a different parameter. Uh, uh, of the index. Now, because this the procedure of moving various punctures on the Riemann surface is a continuous operation, it translates in, in four dimensions to the operation of changing certain coupling constants in four dimensions. Since the index doesn't depend on that, as it doesn't depend on continuous parameters, these two, um, um, these two quantities have to be the same. So an operator acting on parameter Z in the index and an operator acting on parameter u in the index uh, gives mathematically should give mathematically the same result so this is a mathematical prediction following from uh, from this uh, you know vague uh, physical constructions that you uh, that that you have starting from six dimensions and going uh, to four dimensions mathematically this property of of the indices the fact that uh, you can act on different parameters in these functions and get the same result. Uh, uh, it's called that these functions are kernel functions of these analytical difference operators. Another thing that one can show in very similar uh, logic is that uh, if we act with these different operators on the same uh, parameter, but with several of them, the order doesn't matter. Again, the logic that uh, goes into proving the, this is the logic of duality. So it doesn't matter in which order you compute these uh, residues of the index, uh, the result has to be the same, and thus the operators that one obtain have to be commuting operators. So the operators differ by the type of web we turn on. So for any choice of a web we turn on, we have to get uh, the order doesn't matter. So all of these operators, the set of operators we obtain is a set of commuting uh, operators. Finally, another property that I want to mention, again, it's related to dualities. Uh, uh, when we glue two surfaces together, as I mentioned, we need to integrate uh, uh, you know, the indices of the components with, uh, with a certain measure. And we can uh, show that these different operators that we obtain, we can think of them as acting on the, on the fugacity which we integrate over, we kind of do this operation of introducing a surface defect before we do these two theories together and it doesn't matter whether it, we act in uh, on this theory or on this theory the operation should be the same so these operators are self-adjoined in a proper sense under the integration with this particular measure with which we glue surfaces okay so there is a very well defined and precise mathematical structure that uh, one can obtain okay and performing this computation explicitly, there are a lot of uh, the, this, these operators that I have defined, these uh, different operators H, uh, one can obtain a lot of these operators. And it seems it might seem that, you know, there is, uh, it's not clear what you will get from what I have discussed. But in many cases, you get, op you get uh, analytical difference operators which were encountered in, um, in other fields of mathematical physics. For example, if you take the uh, A, A1 2,0 theory and you play this game and you compute the operators which one obtains there, they are related to the so-called Ruizenar-Schneider model uh, corresponding to uh, algebra of, A, of type A1. Okay, so this is how these operators act on certain wave functions, on test functions and uh, some shift operators with the parameters q so these parameters p q and t are related to the fugacities which appear in the index the p and q we have discussed in detail and t is one of these parameters u corresponding to the global symmetry here the global symmetry in six dimensions is su2 we parameterize the fugacity for the cartan generator by t and that's what one what appears here 
if we take the e-string theory that we ma already mentioned, the global symmetry there is E8. So the Cartan is parameterized by eight parameters. And one, again, gets a model which was well studied in mathematical literature, which is called the Van Dijen model, the BC1 type Van Dijen model, which depends on eight parameters, which are related to this uh, group uh, E8. Okay, so these are well uh, studied uh, analytical difference operators or integrable systems in the literature, but one also can get more exotic uh, integrable systems or analytical difference operators if one started general, com more general compactifications. For example, there are theories in 6D which are called minimal A2 and minimal D4 uh, SCFTs in the six dimensions, and they these give rise to in two integrable models, one which uh, acts on a root system or is associated with root system A2, another with the root system A3, which are uh, much more esoteric. But this procedure of the, uh, deriving uh, integrable models from uh, indices of 4D theories coming from six dimensions is very well defined and very simple to perform. So let me summarize uh, this uh, part one. So given a derivation of 4D theories uh, resulting from compact, uh, uh, if we look on 4D theories resulting from compactifications from, uh, starting from six dimensions, uh, these uh, theories in four dimensions satisfy many non-trivial properties uh, like dualities. We don't have proofs of these properties, but we expect these properties on physical ground. By manipulating the indices of these theories in very simple ways, we can derive a set of uh, analytical difference operators. And because of the physical properties, uh, like such as dualities, these analytical difference operators satisfy uh, 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 we expect them to satisfy precise mathematical uh, properties, such as these operators have to commute with each other, so they they form some kind of a set of commuting operators. So that's why I call these uh, systems integrable uh, models. And the indices themselves are what is called kernel functions for these analytical difference operators. Okay. Since the duality properties, the physical properties, all are conjecture, the mathematical properties they have to satisfy are not proven. But you know, if some of these mathematical properties fail to be correct, then something is wrong with the physical uh, argumentation. So something is not correct in, in our derivation. So every time we check these mathematical properties, in a sense, we check non-trivial properties of such as duality in this construction. Okay, so this was a long review of the of the setup, how the different operators appear uh, or integrable models appear in the setup of compactifications. And now uh, I will try to play with these operators a little bit more to study something, about, uh, to say something about them and about their properties. Okay, um, are there any questions? Okay, so we understand now that we have these uh, four-dimensional theories, we have indices, and we have these integrable models or analytical difference operators that we can obtain. And an interesting question is, what is the spectrum of these operators? So we have these well-defined difference operators, and we can ask whether there, there exists a nice set of eigenfunctions for these operators. What are these eigenfunctions? Um, like what may, what other types of properties these eigenfunctions need to satisfy? Well, it's a, it's a good question. Well, one interesting property that is hinted by the fact that these operators are self-adjoint under this gluing measure is, for example, that maybe we need to look for uh, eigenfunctions which are orthonormal under integration against uh, this measure that, uh, that we get from physics, okay? And an interesting uh, conjecture that one can entertain is that maybe we can write the indices uh, that we obtain in four dimensions in these compactification scenarios in terms of this eigenfunction, in this simple uh, single uh, sum over some set uh, of labels of this, uh, of this eigenfunction. And they, uh, this type of a sum is natural, for example, because if indeed we can write the index in such a way the kernel properties of the index will be explicit and will be explicit will be manifest in this uh, in this way of writing things. If we act 
with a different operator now on any one of these uh, um, uh, of these parameters. Uh, uh, so xj are the parameters corresponding to the functions. There are many of them. So if we act on any one of these parameters, say here uh, we have an index with s functions, so we have s parameters, we will manifestly get the same expression. Doesn't matter on which uh, parameter we act because all of these eigenfunctions appearing in this product uh, have uh, uh, have the same label. Okay. So the picture is like that. So what is what is this conjecture? Given a theory corresponding uh, to a Riemann surface with certain uh, genus and certain types of punctures, uh, for each puncture we associate an eigenfunction uh, of this integrable system with the same label lambda as denoted here. And then one can conjecture that the index is just given by summing over this set of lambda properly defined with some coefficients. And these coefficients can depend on the properties of the Riemann surface. For example, how many punctures it has, it has what is the genus, and so on. And it can depend on all the other parameters, but not the parameters of the uh, of the maximal function. Okay, so this is a natural uh, conjecture to entertain, and one can ask whether this conjecture makes sense. For example, one uh, should worry whether this uh, you know series uh, representation of the index is convergent at all, and it is not a not a trivial question to answer. Okay, whether uh, whether this is this would be a formal series, or this this series will have some uh, uh, some nice convergence uh, properties. So what we will do, we will conjecture that indeed one can write such an expression, and that this expression is convergent in the following sense: okay, that we can order the various eigenfunctions that we have here, which are labeled by this lambda, in such a way that if we compute, if we truncate this sum uh, to some first uh, number of eigenfunctions in this ordering, and we want to compute this index in expansion in these parameters q and p, so we assume that these parameters are small and we expand in them, then uh, for some finite uh, value of this, uh, of this truncation, we will get a precise expression for the index, meaning that, uh, that in this partial ordering, the higher eigenfunctions contribute only at very high orders in the expansions in q and p. So this doesn't have to be true. I don't have an argument why this has to be true. We only know that it is likely to be true because we perform computation and then we have seen that uh, this uh, uh, this assumption uh, leads to a sensible results. Okay. One case where this is well known to hold is the is in the following setup. Uh, a very well studied set of examples is uh, taking two comma zero theories and compactifying them on a Riemann surface, which is called uh, the a class S compactification. And as we mentioned, one obtains in this case Ruizner Schneider model as the integrable model. And this model has various limits in which the eigenfunctions are explicitly known. For example, in certain limits, which is in our notations, which are uh, little bit non-standard corresponds to speci specializing the fugacities to be t equals square root of q over p. These eigenfunctions of this integrable model turn out to be just simple sure polynomials. So characters uh, of certain group, what is that group? That group is the group which defines the six-dimensional theory. So the six-dimensional 2 comma 0 theories are classified by AD algebra. So this will be a, a, a sure polynomials for these algebras, and the lambdas will be just finite dimensional irreducible representations of those algebras. And the indices in general for compactification on the genus G surface with S punctures will be given exactly by the expression that, uh, by the general expression that we wrote on the, uh, on the previous, uh, on previous uh, slide, uh, slides, uh, where we explicitly know what these functions are. Okay, this is a, uh, the so-called sure limit um, uh, of n equal to uh, superconformal uh, field theories, and uh, it, it was studied from many different uh, perspectives. Once one has this type of an expression, there is a, a, a huge physical uh, gain that one obtains. In particular, uh, one can obtain, one can compute the Schur index uh, in terms of these uh, Schur polynomials for any theory, for any compactification uh, of 2 comma 0 theory without having this across dimensional duality or Lagrangian uh, in, in four dimensions. Uh, this uh, type of expression doesn't know anything about a Lagrangian. 
uh, once we have uh, this understanding, we can compute indices for any uh, theory in four dimensions of this type. And there are other specialization limits where the, the special functions become McDonald polynomials or whole Littlewood polynomials. And again, a lot is known about these types of expressions. And what we want to do, we want to generalize this uh, to any type of a computation of any theory, any one comma zero STFT in six dimensions, not necessarily uh, uh, the two comma zero theory. And even for the two comma zero theory, we want to compute the index, which depends on the full set of parameters, not just uh, in some specialization. Okay. So the point is that in general, we don't know how to diagonalize these Hamiltonians. We don't know what their eigenfunctions are. But we can combine our understanding, partial understanding of a cross-dimensional dualities with this conjecture to derive at least something which we'll call the ground state eigenfunction of this Hamiltonian. And uh, the logic is as follows. We assume, and again, we show in example that this assumption is true, that this partial ordering of wave function is such that there is a, a wave function labeled by some parameter which we'll call lambda zero, which is in this ordering is smaller than all uh, all the other um, um, all the other parameters. Then one performs the following operation. Say one obtains uh, uh, an across dimensional dual to some compactification which has at least two maximal functions. And as we conjectured before, this has to have the index of it has to have this form with two wave functions and some uh, coefficient. So now what we can do, we can do a lot of these uh, theories together along the punctures. For example, if we have uh, if this, this theory that we are uh, this compactification we're discussing is a genus one compactification, say with zero value of flux with two maximal punctures, we can construct a compactification on a surface which has some genus, higher genus with two maximal punctures by gluing these uh, things together. By pro from the orthogonality property of these wave functions, on one hand, uh, uh, we expect uh, such an expression for the index. On the other hand, if there is another expression of the index given by computation directly in four dimensions of using elliptic gamma functions and various integrals, we can explicitly uh, compute uh, uh, compute these expressions iteratively by gluing one uh, piece to another and so on. Okay, so these are two independent expressions that we can have. Okay, and now the, goes this assumption that lambda zero is smaller than all the other lambda i's in this uh, ordering that we have discussed. And what we can do, we can take the, the number of these glued pieces to be large. Then in, the, in this limit, the dominant contribution will come only from uh, this uh, the eigenfunctions labeled by lambda zero, which we will call uh, ground state eigenfunctions. And then, for example, we can define the, this coefficient, the, the first coefficient appearing in this sum, which will denote by C of lambda zero or C zero. It will be just given by this limiting procedure where we take this uh, limit of this parameter n of glued surfaces to be large and uh, have this uh, have this simple ratio and moreover we can immediately obtain uh, the eigenfunction of this ground state again by uh, some limiting uh, procedure okay so it's important to to stress here that to make this prediction we are assuming that this ordering of wave functions makes sense that uh, when we take this large and limit, this, that these parameters, uh, these the parameters depend on Q and P, such that when increase, when we increase this uh, this labeling lambda i, uh, the powers of Q and P increase, so that uh, the contribution uh, of higher eigenfunctions comes at higher orders in Q and P. And when we take this limit of uh, having large n, they become highly subleading, so that we can write this uh, limiting procedure. Okay, so in this way we can predict uh, eigenfunctions of this integrable, at least one eigenfunction of this uh, integrable model, which is the ground state eigenfunction. Again, this expression we assume is known using across dimensional dualities, and then we immediately obtain a, an eigenfunction of uh, of this integrable model. Now. Again, what this gives us, this gives us two things. First of all, it gives us a mathematical prediction for a certain eigenfunction of an interesting integrable uh, system. 
On the other hand, it also gives us uh, an explicit expression for indices for a large number of, com uh, of uh, compactifications, in a sense, compactifications which are large. For compactifications that we discussed on the previous slide, when we constructed um, uh, constructed these indices from pieces which have genus one, and then we constructed higher genus uh, compactifications, in the limit of large genus, the index to high order in expansion in the Q and P is just given by this coefficient C0 that we have defined uh, to the power G minus one, okay? And the higher the genus, the better is pre the precision of this approximation uh, of the index. And I write here the hat to denote a very particular type of a compactification that we use here, uh, like a, a genus one compactification with two punctures and zero value of flux. In general, I denoted this uh, as a C0. So it seems that this coefficient C0 hat has some uh, universal physical property. So what is the physics? So what is the physical intuition behind these um, uh, conjectures that we are, uh, we are making? So the precise index, again, assuming that we can write it with eigenfunction, say, of genus G compactification is given by this expression, where we sum over all uh, these parameters lambda which appear here. Now, what is the physics of the index? The index counts with science various protected operators in four dimensions, uh, local protected operators. These local protected operators can come from two sources in six dimensions. First, we can take local operators in 6D and smear them on the compactification surface and obtain local operators in four dimensions. Second, we can take surface operators in, in six dimensions and wrap them on the Riemann surface. Both of these constructions would give us local operators, and four-dimensional local operators have origin in one of these two uh, constructions. So a conjecture that one can uh, entertain, and this conjecture is in, well, it's an unpublished uh, work long time ago with, together with David and Leonardo, is that in this type of constructions, the, con the contributions of what one would call C0 of this ground state corresponds to the local operators in six dimensions. And for large compactification, the surface operators will give a subleading contribution to this index computation. Okay? So what this C0 has to capture or might capture conjecturally is the contribution of the, uh, of the local operators uh, in the 6D, which in 6D would be counted by the 6D index. So somehow this C had zero is naturally associated to or is related to the 6D index of the of the theory, although what is the precise relation uh, at the moment, I don't know. Similarly, these ground state eigenfunctions, psi zero, since they're related to the punctures, they probably are related in a very well-defined way to 5D compactifications of the 6D theory. So here is the logic, the physical logic of what is suggested here. So when in general we can compactify higher dimensional theory on some complex uh, compact space, we lose information about this higher dimensional theory. For example, because we lose the KK modes, we project uh, many of the, uh, the things the higher dimensional theory has. However, once we have information in lower dimension about all types of compactifications, maybe some of the information about the higher dimensional theory can be recovered. And that's what we are doing here. We are taking a lot of compactifications. We are taking a large, a limit of large compactification, say large genus, large flux, large number of punctures, some of these compactification parameters being large. And then we claim that there is something about the six dimensional theory that we can extract. And this uh, resonates with this idea of uh, deconstruction, which was entertained long time ago. In this modern language, the deconstruction is just compactification of a torus with a lot of minimal punctures and taking the number of minimal punctures to be very, very large and uh, turning from certain vacuum expectation values. Again, again this is to be con uh, contrasted with the large N limit that people are studying. Large N limit, like for example, N equals four super young mills in this construction is just a torus with a single puncture. And N is a parameter defining the 6D theory. Say you can consider compactification of A N minus one, uh, two comma zero theory and take a large N limit. You are taking um, a limit in the space of uh, 6D theories. Here we are fixing the 6D theory, but are taking a limit of large compactification. So we are, it's, a, it's a different in a sense orthogonal 
limit and uh, we hope to get information about the security theories uh, from it okay so this is the basic idea and in the last several minutes of this talk i will uh, and I will just present some explicit results. So this is the general idea. So the question is whether it works and uh, whether we can apply it uh, in certain examples. So I mentioned several integrable models that one can obtain in this construction. And I will just uh, present the derivation of these eigenfunctions for this example. So the first example is a one Ruizenar Schneider model, which as we mentioned, one obtains from compactifications of a 1 to comma 0 theory. And this is the integrable model or the way it acts uh, on, uh, on test uh, functions. Uh, th that's how this integrable model is defined. Now we, we use a known across dimensional dual, which we also mentioned, which is a sphere with three uh, maximal punctures. For the construction, we need only two punctures. So we just forget about one of the parameters associated to the puncture. This gives us this uh, power of two, which uh, the, this parameter is just not interesting to us. We plug this function into the machinery that we have discussed. Simply, uh, you know, this type of a formula. And we take the limit of uh, large n, we obtain C0, and then we, we, we take, again, take the large n limit, divide the index by C0 to the power of n, and obtain a certain function. And here it is written uh, explicitly here. So this is a result of the computation following the algorithm that we have discussed. And one can actually explicitly check that this function, at least in expansion in these parameters Q and P, is an eigenfunction of elliptic RS model. And this is the value of the energy that one, uh, one gets for this uh, ground state. For example, if we would have followed this algorithm and uh, obtained something which would not be an eigenfunction of this operator, some of our conjectures or assumptions are wrong. However, at least, uh, again, in expansion in these parameters, it seems that uh, this con conjecture uh, or uh, the results are consistent with the assumptions. Uh, of course, it is not a proof uh, of the procedure. Uh, as uh, I mentioned, we also can compute this uh, parameter C0 hat, which has to do something with a six-dimensional index. And uh, again, this can be explicitly computed. For example, uh, if, uh, what one gets is that this quantity uh, has an expansion in these parameters T, which are related to the Cartan generators of the SU2 global symmetry of the 6D uh, theory. We think of the 2,0 theory as a 1,0 theory with global symmetry, which is SU2. In 2,0 language, that SU2 is part of the R symmetry. And then uh, one can uh, verify it again at least in expansion in p and q that uh, that this c0 hat has an expansion in in terms of characters of this uh, 6d global symmetry and it will be interesting to understand this in in terms of 6d index. another model i mentioned is the bc1 van Dijen model which is obtained when studying e string theories and again we can repeat this procedure we have a conjectural explicit across dimensional dual, we can use it to obtain an, a ground state eigenfunction of the uh, Van Dijen model, not to, to write all these parameters explicitly uh, and get something very cluttered. I said it is all of these parameters HI to be the same, so uh, and equal to some uh, parameter T to the minus one. And this is the result one can get. And again, one can verify this at low orders in P and Q uh, that this is an eigenfunction. I didn't mention this before, but this Van Dijen model has a very complicated potential here in terms of theta function. To write it explicitly would take the whole page, so I, I didn't try. It. And again, also here, we can uh, compute this function C0 hat, which would encode uh, 6D physics. And here, for example, interestingly, what happens to the leading order, like uh, say, if we only keep this parameter T that I mentioned before, we obtain some monstrous uh, expression like that, so uh, this parameter, this octet of parameters H i here uh, actually can can be seen as parameterizing an SU8 times a U1 subgroup of the E8 uh, six-dimensional group. So this T1 is the uh, T to the power minus one is the U1 part. And there is a very particular set of numbers appearing here. So this, uh, these numbers which appear here minus three is exactly the character of uh, of the joint representation, 248 dimensional representation of E8. If one would refine 
the index with a full uh, set of parameters hi, one would obtain the character of EA. So the construction of the index doesn't have explicit EA, but in this procedure, we, we see the EA symmetry. And again, it's a non-trivial check of the whole procedure. And we can do the same for the more esoteric uh, models that I mentioned, the one which arise from compactifying minimal A2, 1 comma 0 theory. Again, we have a well-defined uh, operator that one gets. We have uh, an across-dimensional dual that was uh, uh, conjectured in, in, in this paper some time ago. We can find uh, an eigenfunction and we can check that it is actually an eigenfunction and compute its uh, energy again in uh, perturbation theory in the parameters. And the same goes for the uh, final uh, integrable model that I mentioned, the one which uh, is obtained by compactifying D4, uh, one comma z minimal one comma zero SCFT. Again, there is a, a cross-dimensional dual, there is an operator, and we can perform this computation. In this case, actually, the cross-dimensional dual, which is known, uh, is not enough uh, to construct any type of a compactification explicitly. It is only some type of a two-puncture sphere with something with two maximal punctures and two uh, uh, more esoteric types of punctures. So you cannot build generic surfaces from this. Okay, so let me summarize. So uh, we have discussed the simple procedure to construct ground state eigen functions of a variety of interesting integrable models arising in compactification of 6D CFTs. Using these uh, eigen functions, we can construct approximate indices we can also obtain a certain function which should encode uh, local physics in six dimensions. And there are many open questions that I list here. For example, can we go beyond the ground state? Can we directly relate this C0 hat to uh, the six dimensional index? There are interesting questions about uh, convergence of all the expressions that I uh, written down and some modularity questions. Uh, do we have interesting limits of the index uh, and so on? So there is this picture of relation of um, um, six dimensional theories that are claimed to be classified and various integrable models. So I discussed a part of this picture, but there are a lot of other things which are uh, not known. So there is a lot of uh, a lot to discover and a lot to understand. And I think this relation between 6D CFTs and integrable models should be a very, a, a very fruitful one. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. So the, the idea is that, uh, let me go to the beginning. Okay. So these indices are often given by, uh, these indices in four dimensions are given, uh, where do I have this explicit? Here, for example, here. So the indices are given by as integrals, as contour integrals of some uh, functions, elliptic gamma functions which actually have some interesting modular properties. So actually the elliptic gamma functions have some SL3Z properties, but in certain degeneration limits, you can go to theta functions, which have SL2Z uh, modular properties. So these are like Fourier coefficients of some Jacobi modular forms. So as such, you know, they, they might have some mock modular properties in general. And then you will have, say you have a one integral, you compute, uh, you have, a, like an index, the index of free chiral fields can be some, uh, again, in a certain limit can be just a uh, Jacobi modular form, then the integrals will be, have some mock properties. In some cases, they have quasi-modular properties, which are understood, but then you can continue integrate. So in that sense, I mean, uh, beyond. Like what would be the integrals? I don't know. This was not, uh, this was not uh, studied in this context almost at all. I would say it was not studied for the for this supersymmetric. Uh, 